I'm gonna be honest, I'm glad that I live in 2023 because of all of our medical advances. Because if I lived in a world where I couldn't take the medication I take today, I would be screwed. Hello everyone and welcome back to our channel. I'm your host Emily and today we're counting down our list of the top 10 disturbing treatments doctors lied about in history. Number 10, fasting. Linda Lord Hazard, nicknamed the starvation doctor, was a swindler noted for her promotion of fasting, pummeling, and hours long enemas as treatments. In 1911, she was found guilty of manslaughter in the state of Washington and was sentenced to 2 to 20 years of hard labor for ending the lives of at least 15 people for financial gain at a sanitarium she operated near Seattle. Linda developed a fasting method as she claimed was a universal remedy for all manner of illnesses, ridding the body of toxins that caused imbalances in the body. Over the course of her career, she wrote three books about what claimed to be the science behind fasting and how it could cure diseases. Linda established a sanitarium called Wilderness Heights where inpatients fasted for days, weeks, or months on a diet consisting of small amounts of tomato, asparagus juice, and occasionally orange juice. While some patients survived and publicly endorsed her methods, dozens died under her care because starving yourself is not safe and it doesn't cure illnesses. Number 9. Placebos The idea of a placebo effect, a therapeutic outcome derived by an inert treatment was discussed in the 18th century psychology but came more prominent in the 20th century. A placebo is a substance or treatment which is designed to have no therapeutic value. Common placebos include inert tablets like sugar pills, inert injections like saline, sham surgery, and other procedures. In general, placebos can affect how patients perceive their condition and encourage the body's chemical process for relieving pain and a few other symptoms, but have no impact on the disease itself. The use of placebos in clinical medicine raises ethical concerns, especially if they are disguised as an active treatment, as this introduces dishonesty into the doctor's patient relationship and bypasses informed consent. While it was once assumed that the deception was necessary for placebos to have any effect, there is some evidence that placebos may have subjective effects even when the patient is aware that the treatment is a placebo placebo, known as open label placebo. Now the fact that some people didn't even know that they were receiving placebos is scary. Number 8. Snake oil. Yeah. You heard that right. Extracted from the oil of Chinese water snakes, it likely arrived in the United States in the 1800s with the influx of Chinese workers toiling on the transcontinental railroad. Rich in omega-3 acid, snake oil was used to reduce inflammation and treat arthritis and bertitis and was rubbed on the workers' joints after a long day of working on the railroad. This was a real treatment. But then Clark Stanley, the rattlesnake king, entered the scene. Originally a Cowboy Clark claimed to have studied with a hoppy medicine man who turned him on to the healing powers of snake oil. He took this newfound knowledge on the road, performing a show stopping act at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, where he reached into a bag, grabbed a rattlesnake, cut it open, and squeezed it. He labeled the extract snake oil, even though the FDA later confirmed that his products didn't contain any kind of snake oil, rattlesnake, or otherwise. He was scamming people of a real treatment and gave it a bad rap, which is just messed up. Number 7. Diamorphine How do you cure one drug epidemic? Well, create a new drug, of course. That's what happened in the late 1880s when diamorphine was introduced as a safe and non-addictive substitute for morphine. It was created by an English chemical researcher named C. R. Alder Wright in the 1870s, but it wasn't until a chemist working for Bayer Pharmaceuticals discovered Alder's paper in 1895 that the drug came to the market. Finding it to be five times more effective and supposedly less addictive than morphine, Bayer began advertising diamorphine laced aspirin in 1898, which they then marketed towards children suffering from sore throats, coughs, and colds. Doctors then started to have the inkling that the medicine may not be as non-addictive as it seemed when patients began coming back for bottle after bottle. Despite the pushback from the physicians and the negative stories about its side effects piling up, Bayer continued to market and produce their product until 1913. 18. 11 years later, the FDA banned diamorphine altogether. And if you don't know what diamorphine is, look it up and find its street name, and this will make a lot more sense. Number six. 
Fen Pen. Fen Pen was originally released into the market as two separate drugs, an appetite suppressant and an amphetamine. They were marketed as short-term diet aids, but proved largely ineffective on their own. In the late 1970s, however, the two products were combined by Dr. Michael Winstrub to create what became known as Fen Pen. The doctor conducted a single study with 121 patients over the course of four years. The patients, two-thirds of which were women, lost an average 30 pounds with seemingly no side effects, but the study didn't monitor the patient's hearts. The new miracle drug was first introduced into the market in 1992, and people could not get enough of it. Soon, some 6 million Americans were using it. In April 1996, after a heated debate, the FDA agreed to approve the drug pending a one-year trial. Then, almost immediately, reports of grave side effects started pouring in. That July, the Mayo Clinic said that 24 women taking FenPen had developed serious heart valve abnormalities. Hundreds of more cases were reported, and by September 1997, the FDA had officially pulled FenPen. To top it off, more than 50,000 liability lawsuits were filed in the years following its withdrawal from the market. Number 5. Conversion Therapy Conversion therapy is a pseudoscientific practice of attempting to change an individual's sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression to align with heterosexual and cisgender norms. Methods that have been used include forms of brain surgery, surgical or hormonal castration, adversive treatments such as electric shocks, nausea inducing drugs, hypnosis, counseling, spiritual interventions, visualization, psychoanalysis, and sexual reconditioning. There is scientific consensus that conversion therapy is ineffective at changing a person's sexual orientation or gender identity, and that it frequently causes significant long term psychological harm to the individual who undergoes it. Historically, conversion therapy was the treatment of choice for individuals who disclosed same sex attractions or inhibited gender nonconformity, which were formerly assumed to be pathologies by the medical establishment. An increasing number of jurisdictions around the world have passed laws against conversion therapy, as conversion therapy may constitute fraud and has been described by experts as torture, cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment, and contrary to human rights. In some places in the world, though, it's still used, which is horrible. Number four pelvic massage. In the 19th century, hysteria was believed to be caused by any number of sicknesses, including anxiety, irritability, sexual desire, insomnia, faintness, and bloated stomachs. So almost every woman showed some symptoms. The condition traced its roots back to the ancient medical theories about wandering wombs, where a displaced and discontented uterus caused a female ill health. The treatment, a pelvic massage that would induce hysterical paroxysm, leaving them sexually gratified. This was the job of Victorian doctors who manually massaged women, but in an effort to spare the doctors this work, one ingenious practitioner named Joseph Monomer Granville created a steam powered electromechanical medical instrument. Nicknamed the manipulator, the device allowed the women to give themselves home massages, allowing them to cure their wandering wombs, or so they say. Number three, shock treatments. The medical profession has had varying opinions on the causes and possible cures for impotence. The Victorians honed in on a man's moral weakness as the cause for genital dysfunction, and by the 19th century, impotence was thought to be caused by either an excess of sex or self pleasure, or too little of it. Some doctors introduced gavlic baths or bathtubs filled with electrodes, which were supposed to restore sexual desire in just six sessions. Others took even more localized approach, where rods with currents running through them were placed inside the man's urethra, and the treatment would last for five to eight minutes and would be repeated once or twice a week. Ouch. By the late 1800s, ads were running for electropathic belts or electric belts aimed at weak men. They claimed to help cure kidney pains, sciatic nerve issues, backaches, headaches, and nervous exhaustion, but the underlying message was that they could cure men's sexual problems. Number two, Radithor. Radithor was manufactured from 1918 to 1928 by the Bailey Radium Laboratories, Inc. of East Orange, New Jersey. The owner of the company and head of the laboratories was listed as William J. A. Bailey, a dropout from Harvard College, who was not a medical doctor by the way. Radithor was advertised as a cure for the living dead as well as perpetual sunshine. The expensive product was claimed to cure impotence among other illnesses. It was a solution of radium and water which he claimed stimulated the endocrine system. The time of the Radithor and radioactive elixir ended in 1932 with the premature death of one of its most known users, Eben Byers, an American industrialist. 
Ibn Byers was a wealthy American socialite, athlete, industrialist, and Yale College graduate, and was said to have died from radium poisoning in 1932. However, the real cause was various cancers, also as a result of the radithor use. A Wall Street Journal article describing the incident was titled, The Radium Water Worked Fine Until His Jaw Came Off. Yep, yeah, his jaw, literally came off. This history led to the strengthening of regulatory control of pharmaceutical and radioactive products. Thank God. And coming in at number one is lobotomies. Walter Freeman thought he found a way to alleviate the pain and distress of the mentally and emotionally ill, but instead he created one of history's most horrific medical treatments. Early versions of Walter's cure involved drilling holes in the top of his patient's skulls and later involved into hammering an ice pick like instrument through their eye sockets to sever the connections between the frontal lobes and the thalamus, which he believed to be the part of the brain that dealt with human emotions. Emotion. Just thinking about that hurts my head. Walter soon teamed up with James Watts, and after practicing on cadavers, they performed their first procedure on a living patient in 1936, a woman who suffered from agitated depression and sleeplessness. It was deemed a success, but subsequent surgeries were not. Patients were often left in a vegetative state, experienced relapses, and regressed physically and emotionally. As many as 15% died. One of the most infamous victims was Rosemary Kennedy, the sister of future president John F. Kennedy, who was left incapacitated and spent the rest of her life needing full-time care. But everything changed in 1967 when Walter performed a lobotomy on one of his original patients, a housewife. This time he severed a blood vessel and she died of a brain hemorrhage, finally putting the end to Walter's haphazard brain hacking. Well that's all for our list of the top 10 disturbing treatments doctors lied about in history. Which one do you think is the worst? I think all of these are horrible, and I can't believe that this was acceptable back in the day. Ugh. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and why not give us a like and subscribe. I'm your host Emily, and I'll see you next time. Peace.